Celtic Park, home of Celtic Football Club. Record-breaking nine times in a row Scottish champions. British football's first European Cup winners. And a club which has harboured dark secrets. They chose the reputation of a football club over the safety and well-being of 12-year-old children. Why did no one question that this person who abused me had the same wee boy with them week after week after week. They put the club before young boys, young boys whose lives were subsequently ruined. Who else knew and didn't do anything? There is a way that organisations should respond to these events. They should act fast. If you don't do that, and they're adding insult to injury. They had to know, and their decision was to keep it quiet. They knew then, they know now. This story starts in 1966. A football coach named Jim Torbett asks Celtic chairman Sir Robert Kelly and manager Jock Steen for permission to set up a youth football club in Glasgow. He wants to use the club's name and famous green and white hooped kit. Kelly and Steen agree and Celtic Boys Club is born. Over the years, it provides a steady stream of young players who go on to turn pro for Celtic. Club legends like Charlie Nicholas, Paul McStay, Roy Aitken, Tommy Burns, Pat Nevin, David Moyes and many more. But there was something sinister going on at Celtic Boys Club as well. The sexual abuse of children. Sometimes it even took place here at Celtic Park. It affected dozens of youngsters and went on for decades. Is that Andrew in that? That's Andrew. Yeah, because he looks, you can see he's shooting up there, isn't he? Oh, I... Andrew Gray was a promising young footballer. Celtic Boys Club snapped him up at the age of 12. What did it mean to sign for Celtic Boys Club? It was huge, definitely. His dad was so proud, especially when he came home with the, the blazer and things yeah. like that. I was proud as well. I think back then it was one of these clubs that, you know, if you signed for them and you worked hard, potentially you could go on to bigger and better things. And that's definitely what, what was told to Andrew and, and told to mum mm -hmm. and dad. Mm -hmm. He was so proud mm -hmm. to be part of the Celtic family mm -hmm. as, as what it was. You know, Celtic Boys Club were, were a huge part of the Celtic family. But as Andrew spent more time at Celtic Boys Club, he began to change. It wasn't very long after he signed for them that he started changing. He just started changing. He wasn't the, the boy that we had brought up and was a fun boy and all the rest of it. His, his whole mood had just changed. This volatile behaviour, these outbursts, mm -hmm. it was, right, well, he's a teenager. This is what mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, looking back now, we know that that, that wasn't the no. case. It wasn't until three decades later that Andrew revealed that he had been abused over a three-year period by his coach, Jim Torbett, the founder of Celtic Boys Club. Torbett would ask Andrew to go up to the house, right, and say, oh, come on, we're going to have a cinema night or something like that. And Andrew said that Torbett always had this chair and nobody was allowed, this black leather chair, nobody was allowed to sit on it except Torbett. And Andrew would be sitting on the city, and then after you barely see, Torbett would come off there, and then she's way along here, and abuse him. Torbett would take the furthest away boy mm -hmm. home first, mm -hmm. and then gradually everybody mm -hmm. else would get dropped off. And then he and would then drive. He would take Andrew away and abuse him. He in would the car. drive to this place and he would abuse him in the car. It doesn't even bear thinking about it, you know, knowing that he suffered what he did at his hands. It's just, it does haunt you, it really does. It breaks my heart to think that me as a mother and my son went through that and I couldn't help him. It just makes me feel worthless, it really does. Because I should have, I should have helped him. But I didn't know, honestly, I didn't know what was happening. So Torbett, how do you respond to allegations that you sexually abused children at Celtic Boys Club? You abused your position of trust at Celtic Boys Club. How many boys were there? 
In 2017, Jim Torbett was tracked down to the United States by the BBC and forced to return to Scotland. A year later, he was convicted of abusing Andrew Gray and two other boys, including one as young as five. Sadly, Andrew wasn't there to see justice done. He had died in a tragic swimming pool accident in Australia. But his written testimony played a vital role in securing a conviction against Torbett. The trial started um, 26th of October 2018 and... There was three police officers that read out Andrew's evidence. He'd given six separate statements, which were very, very detailed. Um, Mum and I took the stand also, which was horror horrific, you know, having to look at Torbett and, and just be there, breathing the same air as him. What did it mean to you to see Jim Torbett convicted? I was crying tears of joy. You know, we've got him. Mm -hmm. Andrew asked me, get him and we've got him, um, but it was tinged with so much sadness. The judge who jailed Torbett pulled no punches in his summing up. You use the club as a front and a recruiting ground for boys who you could sexually abuse. You groomed boys and contrived situations when you could abuse them. Yours was some of the most corrupting behaviour I have heard of in these courts. 2018 wasn't the first time Torbett had been found guilty of offences involving youngsters from Celtic Boys Club. Two decades earlier, in 1998, he'd been convicted of similar offences against three of their players. Torbett's victims included former Manchester United and Scotland star Alan Brazil. Those earlier offences, like his abuse of Andrew, took years to come to light. So why does it take so long for victims to come forward? For psychologist Dr John Marshall, who was an expert witness at Torbett's 2018 trial, it's a sadly familiar story for men who have been abused. Male victims have real problems in coping with, with, with sexual abuse. Uh, generally speaking, they, 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 they struggle with managing their feelings. They think of themselves as not a true man. Um, how can I be a real man if this has happened to me? Why didn't I fight off the, the perpetrator? Uh, why wasn't I stronger? Their careers or their, their hopes and dreams might depend upon what that coach says and does. Maybe there's a great deal of fear about disclosing about what happened to them because of the potential impact on their whole dreams, their careers, their future. Some people have personality traits in these uh, roles where they're... Um, outgoing, persuasive, um, quite grandiose, um, excellent at manipulation, persuading others that they're safe to be around, and that they can be relied on and trusted, but at the same time they've got a plan. The plan is to sexually groom that individual. It's such a gradual and insidious process, it's often by the point they're being abused, it's step by step towards that, that the victims don't realise they're in that position until it's too late. It's taken Gordon Woods 50 years to break his silence and say that he too was abused by a coach at Celtic Boys Club. I had just turned 13, my birthday was in June, and I joined Celtic in the late summer of, of 1967. Celtic had just won the European Cup a few months prior to that. And of course, with that being the premier trophy in, in European football, it was an enormous honour. Within a month or two of starting to train with the boys club, my abuser had started to run me home at, after training. I was very unhappy at home and he made a point of taking me home to discuss the issues I was having. You know, he very quickly became not just a football trainer, he very quickly became a very close friend. I was giving him a confidence in things that <clears throat> I hadn't discussed with anyone else. But this individual um, made me feel secure enough that I would open up to him. And he used that against me. So he was grooming you? 100%. The very first night I was abused, as I left the car, he grabbed hold of my leg 
And he said to me, don't worry, Gordon. I won't tell your mum and dad what you've done. Because if your mum and dad find out, they won't let you come back to the Celtic Boys Club. And he said, you don't want to leave all your friends at the club, do you? Now, I can remember that. I can remember it. I can picture his face when he said it, Adrian. I was made to feel that it was all my fault, that everything that was happening was something that I, I wanted. But even at the time, I was disgusted by it. I lost count of the amount of times I tried to, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I've lost count of the amount of times I tried to vomit and I couldn't. There was no vomit left. I tried to cry, there was no tears left. Gordon says his abuser was Jim Torbett, the same coach who, almost two decades later, abused Andrew Gray. His allegations are now being investigated by Police Scotland. He says that he wishes he had spoken up sooner because it could have prevented other youngsters like Andrew from being hurt. My coming forward could have saved so many other wee boys from going along that path, but I didn't. And at the moment, I'm angry with people who are remaining silent. They're, keep, they're saying nothing. They're hiding these things that are happening to kids. I did that as well. I stayed quiet, which I shouldn't have done. I should have came forward a long time ago. Rumours about Jim Torbett were rife for years in Glasgow, but it wasn't until 1996 that they were finally aired in the media. The story was broken by the Daily Record. Ian Ferguson was one of the journalists involved in the scoop. Everybody involved uh, not just in Scottish football, but in uh, the day-to-day -day life of uh, life in Glasgow, uh, knew about the rumours. It had been 20 odd years that this, you know, oh, everyone, you know, was nudge, nudge, wink, wink, but there it was in black and white. And in those days, as I hope they still do, everyone believed the record, you know. We did run with Jim Torbett, uh, revealing uh, one of the beasts of Celtic Boys Club who'd ruined so many players' uh, careers, not, not only their careers, their lives as young men, we followed it all the way through splashes, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the following Sunday. Most of the incidents uh, that we ended up breaking and, and reporting about had taken place in the mid-70s. It was hard to begin with, but once, you know, the floodgates opened, they did open. And Jim Torbett wasn't the only one. Four other people with connections to Celtic Boys Club or Celtic FC have been convicted of child abuse. They include Jim McCafferty, who was a coach at Celtic Boys Club and Celtic FC youth team. One victim has even claimed that McCafferty trafficked him to notorious English paedophile Barry Bennell. Although this has never been proved, McCafferty was convicted of offences involving 10 teenage boys between 1972 and 1996. There was also John Cullen. Gerald King, Neil Strachan, a suspected fifth abuser who claimed to be a Celtic scout is beyond the reach of the UK authorities despite international warrants for his arrest because he lives in Vietnam. Now people will say quite rightly that other clubs have been tainted by child abuse too not least Celtic's bitter Glasgow rivals, Rangers. Their head of youth development, Gordon Neely, was sacked in 1991, for instance, over suspicions of abuse. And although the club said it reported the incident to the police, Neely's alleged victim has disputed that. What makes Celtic unique, though, is the sheer number of abusers who, one way or another, had connections either to the football club or Celtic Boys Club. Given the scale of the abuse and the length of time it continued, you have to ask, did anyone at Celtic know what was going on? It's a question that goes right to the top of the club. 
even to its greatest manager. Lisbon, Celtic versus Inter Milan in the final of the European Cup. If any British team could win this coveted trophy, it had to be Celtic. Barely seven minutes from time came the winning goal. Chalmers deflected Murdoch's shot past Sati. Jock Steen is a Celtic legend. In 1967, he brought the European Cup back to Glasgow. They were the first British club to win the trophy. But did Jock help cover up Celtic's shameful secrets? Billy McNeil and his magnificent men earned the thanks and admiration of their native Glasgow, Scotland and the whole United Kingdom. Celtic fans are sometimes taunted with the claim that Steen was aware of what was going on. There's even a song about it. Sadly, he isn't here to defend himself. But there is evidence to support the claim that Big Jock knew. Former Celtic Boys Club chairman Hugh Burt testified under oath in a court case in 1998 that Steen had been aware of abuse allegations. Burt said Steen had physically ejected Torbett after hearing the rumours. According to Mr Steen, he literally put his foot up his backside and kicked him out. It was all covered up by Celtic Football Club as to why he was kicked out. When I joined as chairman, I was told by Jock Steen to keep the name of Celtic Football Club clean at all times. Those people did not want the good name of Celtic Football Club blackened. They did not want the club they loved uh, dragged through the courts, which in hindsight is a terrible indictment on those people. Hubert said that, as a result of his testimony, he was ostracised by Celtic and had privileges like access to the director's box withdrawn. He shouldn't have been ostracised. Hubert uh, was someone who worked tirelessly to get this exposed and uh, helped the, the reporting team at the record greatly. And he would not have mentioned the name of Jock Steen and suggested that Jock Steen knew about the abuse unless he had good evidence to say. Oh, no, definitely not. He was an upstanding citizen. He was uh, well respected uh, within the club. He was a friend of Jockstein. Uh, he, wouldn't, he certainly wouldn't have done that had he not believed it to be the truth. He was a huge, huge Celtic fan, huge admirer of Jockstein. So for him to stand in court and say that uh, took a lot. Hugh, I think, went to his grave feeling a, a wrong had been, had, had been done. Another Celtic director at the time, James Farrell, said he had never heard the rumours and defended Jockstein's reputation in court. But journalist Ian Ferguson, who helped expose the abuse, has little doubt. I think probably Jock did know of the goings on, but for whatever reason, uh, they were swept under the carpet. I think he had to know. What makes this story even more shocking is that after Jockstein left Celtic in 1978, Jim Torbett was allowed back. In the early 80s, he was given a role overseeing the club shops and merchandising operations. And he was also back at Celtic Boys Club, where he had access to young players like Andrew Gray. Jock Steen wasn't the only well-known Celtic manager with grounds to suspect abuse was happening. Lou Macari, a Celtic manager in the early 1990s, wrote in his autobiography that he had been approached by a youth player who said he'd been abused by a coach on a tour to North America. Macari said there was no mechanism within the football club for dealing with the allegation. Crucially, he never reported it to the police. Macari wouldn't be interviewed on the record for this film, but confirmed to us that he stood by the account in his book. And it's not only Celtic's former managers who have difficult questions to answer. So do two of the club's ex-directors. Kevin Kelly was a director of Celtic from 1971 to 1994, the last three years as chairman. He was the nephew of Sir Robert Kelly, who had sanctioned the creation of Celtic Boys Club. As well as his role on the Celtic FC board, Kelly also served as president of the Celtic Boys Club. 
He also worked from 1986 for a business in Glasgow called the Trophy Centre, which sold scarves and other merchandise. The owner of the Trophy Centre was Celtic Boys Club abuser Jim Torbett. Kevin Kelly has said in recent times that he didn't know about the abuse, that he wasn't aware of the rumours. Is that likely? No. He certainly wouldn't be unaware of the rumours. That, that's not credible at all. He must have known about the rumours. And yet he became a business partner of Jim Torby in the Trophy Centre. Crazy, yeah, yeah. Um, what can you say? I mean, it's, uh, again, it's very, very sad. And I think Torbett uh, traded on uh, his uh, closeness to people like Kevin Kelly, and uh, he tried to make that uh, part of his background that proved he was a good guy. While well, he, he wasn't, you know, he tried to make himself an integral part of, of Celtic Football Club. While Torbett was serving time here at Barlini Prison, he was still earning money from Celtic. It wasn't until 2002, four years after he was jailed for child abuse, that the club finally cancelled its lucrative contract with the Trophy Centre. During that period, it had paid them more than £1 million. By the end of the contract, Torbett was no longer a director of the company. Kevin Kelly still was. When Kevin Kelly was approached by the Daily Record in 2019, he denied ever being a director of the Trophy Centre, even though company's house records say the opposite. Those same company's house records also show that Kelly was a director of three other businesses with Torbit too. Kelly said he had no knowledge of the past. He has previously said that he had no knowledge of the allegations against Torbit when he returned to Celtic Boys Club in the late 70s, and that he wasn't aware of any previous allegations against Torbit until his court case in the 1990s. He didn't respond to our questions for this film. Another Celtic director, Jack McGinn, also worked for the Trophy Centre. He was hired in 1998 the same year that Jim Torbett was first convicted. McGinn was a Celtic director from 1981 to 1994, including a five-year spell as chairman. He also served as president of the Scottish Football Association. Back in 1965, he'd created the Celtic View newspaper, which contained weekly updates on Celtic Boys Club and revelled in their successes. The paper, edited by McGinn, published a glowing testimonial to Jim Torbett in 1974, even though we now know he left under a cloud. McGinn has said that all stories in the paper were published in good faith and has denied allowing a false article to be published. Once Torbett returned in the late 70s, suspicions that he and others were using Celtic Boys Club to exploit youngsters continued. Jack McGinn has said he had no knowledge of Torbett's offending when he returned to the club. Celtics certainly were aware of the rumours. In 1986, the Celtic View reported that the board of directors had investigated the allegations and found them to be unsubstantiated. The Celtic View said the claims were scurrilous and warned that the leaders of Celtic Boys Club, whose lives had been placed under a cloud, would go to court if necessary to bury the stories once and for all. Could Jack McGinn have been unaware no. of the rumours? Sadly not, no. I don't think anybody who even attended Celtic Park, uh, not even on a, a daily or weekly, but even a, a monthly basis, could be unaware of the rumours. The rumours were rife. In 1991, one Celtic Boys Club player said that he had been abused by a coach on a trip to the United States. It was later reported that Jack McGinn had been involved in a meeting, which resulted in that incident being kept quiet. Ian Ferguson got to hear about it though. In 1991, I'm in the office uh, in uh, Anderson Quay at the uh, roundabout 
10 o'clock uh, on a Friday morning, take a phone call, an anonymous phone call saying that an incident had occurred on uh, an American tour, uh, Celtic Boys Club, one of the players had been molested by one of the coaches They were staying in uh, a private house belonging to one of the uh, American people who'd, uh, Celtic supporters who'd arranged the trip for the Boys Club over to Kearney, New Jersey. We uh, contacted uh, people both within the Boys Club and the Football Club it was denied. We were on the back foot because we didn't have a name of the, the young player who'd uh, been molested. We went up several blind alleys, but we never really gave up with the story. Uh, round about that time as well, we, we managed to identify uh, the person who was meant to be the coach who'd molested uh, the player. And it went quiet for a few years, but we never really gave up. It wasn't until five years later, in 1996, that the Daily Record felt able to publish the allegations. Former Celtic Boys Club chairman Jim McNally broke his silence to claim that Jack McGinn had held a meeting with the abused boy and his family. They wanted it kept quiet. The coach was allowed to resign, citing pressures of work. Again, it seems the police were not informed. Hello, Mr. McGinn. Hey, yeah. My name is Adrian Goldberg. I'm a filmmaker, oh, yeah. and I've come to ask you if you'd possibly give me so an interview. So how much did Jack McGinn know? Why had he worked with Torbit when rumours that he was an abuser were rife? And why, years earlier, had he given him a glowing reference in the Celtic view? What did he know about the episode of abuse involving a coach in North America? We went to invite him for an interview. There are people out there who, who say, as I'm sure you know, that you allowed an abuser to walk away from Celtic and Celtic Boys Club without a sign of their name. Bye bye. Can I, can I have an interview please, Mr McGinn? Mr McGinn doesn't want to give us an interview. Jack McGinn didn't respond to our request for an interview. But when previously asked whether Jim McNally's account of their meeting after the New Jersey incident was true, he said, it could be, or it could be vaguely different. He also claimed to have urged officials at Celtic Boys Club to report their concerns to the police, but it seems he didn't do so himself. When the abuse story broke in 1996, Celtic's new owner, Fergus McCann, set up a hotline to help victims. But that was an exception. For most of the time since the story became publicly known, Celtic FC has sought to distance itself from responsibility for what happened at Celtic Boys Club. Now, for years, Celtic Football Club has argued that it was a separate entity from Celtic Boys Club. They've expressed sympathy for the victims, but say, in essence, it was nothing to do with us, Gov. But for many of the youngsters who played for Celtic Boys Club, the two organisations were certainly not seen as separate. Celtic um, and Fergus McCann set up a um, helpline mm -hmm. for potential victims and their families. How then, 20 years later, could they then say, sorry, this has nothing to do with us? It was the same man, it was the same club, same organisation. There was nothing that would indicate that we weren't part of the Celtic family. Absolutely nothing. In fact, it was the opposite. It was promoted to you that success with the boys club could well lead to success with Celtic Football Club. You guys would go along to some events at uh -huh. the, some uh -huh. big hotels in the city centre and, you know, there'd be Celtic players there that had came through from the Celtic nights. Boys Club. So you, it was mm -hmm. plain to see, you know, these guys came from where you are just now, so you, mm -hmm. you know, stick in and you could be the next Charlie mm -hmm. Nicholas, the next Paul McStay. On many occasions, the, my abuser would take me to Celtic Park, we would sit in the, the director's box, um, I would attend functions at Celtic Park and these functions would be attended by Celtic football players, Celtic football management, the directors of Celtic Football Club. We were mixing with the, the, the creme de la creme of Celtic at that time. Celtic uh, Football Club uh, took players from Celtic Boys Club. The Boys Club uh, had functions at Celtic Park. It was part and parcel. It was the feeder club. Uh, for the senior club. That doesn't sound much like a separate entity, does it? In fact, the links were everywhere. 
Celtic Boys Club often trained at Celtic's training ground, Barrowfield, where some of the abuse took place. They got to play matches at Celtic Park, where Celtic Boys Club sometimes held their AGM. Some children were abused at the stadium. Issue after issue of the club's weekly paper, the Celtic View, celebrated the exploit of Celtic Boys Club and its close links to the senior club. It's been reported that Celtic FC even funded Celtic Boys Club. I think anyone uh, in any walk of life in Glasgow who knew anything about football would say Celtic Boys Club was an integral part of Celtic Football Club. The Celtic Boys Club organisation certainly made you believe that you were part of Celtic, 100%. Celtic did pay compensation to a victim of abuser Jim McCafferty because of his role at Celtic's youth team. But youngsters connected only with the boys club have received no help or compensation. Now in 2019, Celtic revealed that they'd launched their own independent inquiry into historic child sex abuse at the club, which they said was being managed by an experienced lawyer. By that stage, the review had already been running for two years, but no one outside the club had even heard of it. And to date, no one outside the club has seen its findings. The first we found out about it was when it was reported Got on. It. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was eight months after our trial. Um, Andrew was never contacted um, by them. And we speak to a number of other victims and survivors mm. and their families, and neither have they, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. How can you have an investigation and not speak Contact to the, the victims, victims mm -hmm. who've suffered at the hands of these men? It, it's beyond belief. Now you might have thought all this would have been worthy of investigation by the Scottish Parliament, especially as in 2015 they launched an inquiry into historic child abuse. But when it came to football, they handed that responsibility over to the Scottish FA. After numerous delays and false starts, the SFA report was finally published in February 2021. It dismissed the idea that clubs like Celtic could claim to be separate from community-based feeder teams like Celtic Boys Club. The Independent Review said, If the relationship and history between the youth football club and the senior club was so shared, so close and so inextricable, then when sexual abuse of young players form part of the history of one, then it too form part of the history of the other. A shared heritage is not confined to trophies, victories and celebration. It also extends to defeats, failures and deficiencies. But although the report made 97 recommendations, it couldn't compel clubs to help survivors or their families. Celtic has since repeated its sincere sympathy, regret and sorrow for all those affected across Scottish football, including at Celtic FC and Celtic Boys Club. But victims and survivors of Celtic Boys Club haven't been given any practical support. The idea of the separate entity lives on. So why, all these years later, does it matter if Celtic won't accept full responsibility? The sad truth is that many survivors need support after being traumatised by their abuse. They might turn to alcohol or drugs to dampen down flashbacks or post-traumatic stress symptoms. And they can also harbour a great deal of rage and anger about what has happened to them and that can be expressed in other ways. Violence, um, assault charges uh, that they have to face as well. But it's not just mental health. It's the effect that it has on their ability to form relationships, their effect on whether they can sustain relationships over the long term. They might be in and out of relationships. They might have problems tr with trust. So it has a really pervasive um, wave-like effect throughout their lives and other people's lives. From where my children were, were, were babies, in their toddler years, you know, first few years at school, I found it very difficult to hold them, kiss them, sit them on my knee. If I sat them on my knee, within minutes I, I, 
I could feel the guilt manifesting inside me. You know, I've got a child on my knee. <clears throat> Even though she was, or he was my child, I had to put them down. I couldn't <clears throat> have them there. When your own daughter or your own son falls and hurts themselves, to not be able to go and pick them up and caress them, the guilt that I had to get out of that, I had to get away from it. And I did, I got away from it. The entire Grey family was affected by Andrew's abuse. He struggled really with day-to-day -day life. Um, he couldn't really hold down a job properly. No. He'd have relationships, they'd break up. And he suffered terribly with his mental health. I mean, depression was... Oh, really bad. He obviously had his addiction problems with some drugs. Um, and he had a gambling addiction as well. And we'd do what we could to help him, and he'd be okay for so long. And then... And then uh -huh. he would have another mm -hmm. episode. And that was just the cycle. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many doors in this house no, were. Uh -huh. He'd punched holes and, you know, he'd be out in the garden. My dad would be trying to calm him down. He'd lift his mm -hmm. hands to my dad. And then afterwards, he would be sobbing like so, a baby. Uh, that's it. You that's know, it. and he would be so apologetic. Mm -hmm. And he would say, I don't know where it came from. I'm mm. really, really sorry. And, you know, when he told us what, you know, had happened, um, for me, it was just like a bit of the jigsaw. It, it oh, just started definitely. to make sense. It was so embarrassed, Adrian, about what people would think of him, you know, um, that he hadn't stopped it and he had allowed it to happen. And we just kept telling him, you have got nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed yeah. about, Andrew. You were a child. <laughs> you were a 12-year-old child. And after Andrew disclosed his abuse, he tried to take his life three times? Three, three times, times, yeah, between mm -hmm. December 2016 mm -hmm. and July 2017. Mm -hmm. um, that was... They were dark months. Mm -hmm. A number of former Celtic Boys Club players who were abused or were thought to have been abused died tragically young, some as the result of drug or alcohol addiction, common amongst victims of abuse. Others took their own lives. We've been told that at least six former Celtic Boys Club players killed themselves, and the real figure could be much higher. The Scottish FA Review notes that almost every account provided to the review speaks of suicide attempts or suicidal thinking being experienced by very young teenagers and continuing and often increasing well into their adult lives. Many also engaged in prolonged or episodic self-harming behaviour, including substance abuse and addiction. Dr John Marshall believes that organisations should take full responsibility for what happens in their name. There is a way that organisations should respond to these events. They should act fast. They should take decisions quickly. They should acknowledge the full harm that's been done and the impact that's happened on victims and the long-term impact that that will have on the victims as well. They should be completely open and transparent about their role and responsibility uh, over that coach. And the apology that they give should be full, complete and acknowledge everything that's happened. But they should then go further and offer the support that's needed for victims by being open, transparent and offering, offering full support to, to victims uh, is more likely to be helpful if you don't do that and they're adding insult to injury. While we've been making this film, we've been really keen to try and engage with Celtic and requested an interview with their chief executive, Peter Lawwell. Unfortunately, that request was declined. So we've come to see Peter Lawwell at his home in this rather posh suburb of Glasgow to see if he'll have a chat with us here. Well, there are three cars that I can see in the drive up there. It looks to me as though there are people at home. Sadly, no one is answering the bell. Celtic did later send us a statement. It said they wouldn't be able to give us an interview for the film 
They said they were appalled by any form of historic abuse and have great sympathy for victims and their families. Celtic said it would be dealing with these issues in a responsible manner and would stand by its responsibilities, respecting the due process of law. Now, sadly, we can't turn the clock back and prevent the abuse of the past. But is there anything we could do to stop similar things happening in future? Throughout this film, we've heard about people who either knew about abuse or heard rumours of abuse and did nothing to stop it. And their inaction led to more young boys getting hurt. Child abuse survivor Tom Perry believes something can and must be done. He wants to see the introduction of a law of mandatory reporting. Tom, what is mandatory reporting? Mandatory reporting is law which requires those people who work in such settings as uh, sport, healthcare, faith, schools, to report known or suspected child abuse on reasonable grounds to the local authority or the police. And failure to report would result in a criminal offence with a fine. That's what we're proposing. Are there any examples that we can draw on from around the world where mandatory reporting has been introduced and can be seen to be successful? Of the jurisdictions on all four continents, 72% of Asia, 76% of Africa, 86% of Europe and 90% of the Americas have some form of mandatory reporting. We have none. In the case of Celtic Boys Club, how might mandatory reporting have made a difference? What most people suffer from is fear, fear to report, fear of going rogue. Because at the moment, if you're a whistleblower, you have to go rogue. You're reporting against the organisation that may even be paying you. It's not a comfortable position to be in. And suddenly you're isolated, ostracised. It's bad news. Well, mandatory reporting changes all that. These settings are key. They're key for perpetrators. They've got the holy trinity that perpetrators seek. They've got power, opportunity and secrecy. Now, those three ingredients are disrupted when you have mandatory reporting. The mandatory reporting is the one area that will stop the silences. It won't stop the abusers, unfortunately, because they'll always be there. But the mandatory reporting will break this cycle of being allowed to remain silent. If you are part of an organisation and you suspect that this no. is going on, it must be reported and mm -hmm. it must be investigated by the correct people, you know, by the police. That's something that I will campaign for, you know, in the, the coming months and years, that there is something put in place because we can't afford this to happen again. This story isn't about football, of course, it's ultimately about justice. So we tried speaking to Scotland's Justice Minister, Hamza Youssef, about Celtic Boys Club, Celtic FC and mandatory reporting. He's not normally shy when it comes to talking about Celtic, but unfortunately, he declined our request for an interview. Nor did he respond to the specific points we raised. A spokesman said the safety and well-being of all children and young people is a key priority for the Scottish Government, as is ensuring that victims of abuse are supported both through the justice system and beyond. Humza Youssef hasn't met with the family of victims like Andrew Gray or Gordon Woods, leaving them to battle on alone in their fight for justice, even though they are keen to meet him. What do they now want from Celtic? I think they should own up to their failings over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We should have been more diligent in ensuring that our children playing under our banner were safe. I think they're completely oblivious to the pain and suffering that this has caused. A party of Celtic Football Club abused me 50 years ago in the 1960s. And in the 2020s, Celtic Football Club are still abusing me. How many wee boys within your community are suffering in silence right now. Celtic Football Club have been in denial totally, 100%. This is one of the biggest travesties in Scotland. They've got to answer to it.